All right, today we're going to start on uh, part two of the book. This is a pretty interesting part of the uh, book because it, um, it this entire unit, uh, chapters five, six, seven, and eight, all share a common theme, and that common theme is that uh, even when we believe that we are making our own decisions and choices, um, we're usually being influenced by outside factors. Um, other things like... Like, well, here, here's your thing. What are the unseen social forces which push and pull us? Not just social, we'll talk about some biological forces, too. But um, clearly, there is no such thing as, you know, uh, somebody who is separated from the rest of the world. These are those those different forces, those things that are going to um, influence the choices we make and the decisions we make. All right? So in today's material, uh, Chapter 5, we're going to talk about genetics a little bit. Um, we're going to lay out a little bit of... Um, a little bit of evolution, not a whole huge amount, but a little bit of evolution. Throw in some some effects of culture, the coach culture influences, and then talk about gender because, of course, the the fact of being a boy or a girl does, in fact, influence you in some ways. Okay, so uh, you know, well, some of the questions: How are we influenced by human nature and cultural diversity? How are genders? Uh, blah blah blah. Okay. Uh Nature versus nurture. Okay, you all heard about nature versus nurture. All right, let's start a little bit with the nature first. Well, okay, it's very brief, I guess, just in case, right? Nature versus nurture, that is to say, um, it's an old argument, old philosophical argument. Question is, um, you are a really complicated person, and uh, where did it come from? Is you, Are you, this complicated person, the result of nature, the uh, egg met sperm, and that's who you became? Or is it nurture, the environment that you were raised in? Now, obviously, the answer is both, a combination of both. Um, and so we're going to kind of lay out nature and nurture a little bit uh, to because they, they both influence us. And, and again, I mean, remember that part, this whole part two uh, of the textbook is all about I make my own choices. No, you don't. Okay, there are all these other factors that are influencing you, including the uh, environment that you were raised in and including the biology that you were given. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, here's a, uh, an interesting book. I just kind of want to lay out a little groundwork because I'm going to very briefly talk a little bit about Darwinian evolution. But before I can do that, I want to um, kind of give a little background. You know, Darwin Darwin was a, was a genius. I love Darwin. But he didn't, uh, it didn't come out of thin air. He, he definitely had some predecessors, some people before him that had ideas. Um, before him, Jean Lamarck wrote a book called Philo Philosophie Zoologique. I don't know, it's a good book. Um, but in it, he noted that the fossils, when you dig them up out of the ground, don't look the same as the animals that live here on Earth. Okay, And he basically established that animals do, in fact, change over time. Okay. We're going to talk about that diversity stuff later, but you know, animals do change over time. And so Lamarck put together this this notion. He believed that the the you know the well animals change with time, and the question is why do they change with time? And so of course Darwin's going to have his own natural selection thing that we'll get to. But um, Jean Lamarck said uh, no, there's this thing called inheritance of acquired characteristics. That is to say, um, giraffes, if you take a look at the left side of this graph, of the picture, rather, it's kind of silly looking. We see this giraffe, and the giraffe is hungry, and so the giraffe stretches its neck a little bit to reach a little bit higher. And in the process of stretching its neck, it, um, it pulls it apart a little bit and makes it a little bit longer, right? And then this change in the length of its neck is then passed along to its children. So according to this... Um, Characteristics that are acquired by the parents are then passed along, inherited by the children. Okay. Now we have access to modern genetics, and uh, we see this is kind of silly, right? And I'm thinking, um, up in Ethiopia, they got those women with the uh, they put the rings in their necks, and the rings are long and everything. And when those when when those women have babies, do their babies have long necks? No. Okay, they're not born with long necks. We see this, and it's kind of a silly thing. However, we're gonna we're gonna give Lamarck his his due when we come back to epigenetics more towards the end uh, uh, later in this slide. I think it was actually very um. All right. So what was out there before Darwin? 
there's this basic idea that uh, food supply increases arithmetically and populations increase geometrically. This was Thomas Malthus. And um, what this is, is uh, the basic idea that um, the number of organisms in an environment will always be higher than the amount of food available. Always. There will always be selective pressure. In other words, somebody's always going to be dying. Okay, and so what what the theory of evolution is really all about is who is it that's going to be dying because somebody's going to be dying because there's always going to be more animals than the the, uh, the environment can support. Um, Gregor Mendel's work on um, um, genetics didn't occur until after Darwin's uh, death, well after Darwin's death, so Darwin could not take advantage of the um, the, the beauty of genetics, okay? But what was also established is, in fact, it was established by Darwin himself in many ways. It was his earliest work before he wrote about evolution. His earliest work was about the diversity of the natural world. That is, um, uh, how much, his first book, in fact, was about uh, mussels, you know, those uh, snail kind of thingies that stick to the bottom of a, of a ship or something. I, what, I don't know, just those barnacles, I mean, barnacles, not even mussels, barnacles stuck to the bottom. And he uh, noted all of the different ways that barnacles can vary, that they are, um, some are big, I mean, I don't know barnacles, okay, but I mean, some are bigger, some are smaller, some have three coils, some have two coils, some have a brown band, some have a light brown, I mean, you know, they have all of these different factors that can vary, and they do vary, okay, and so we could take that same kind of a notion and spread it to humans and say, you know, some are taller, some are shorter, some are heavier, some are lighter, some have darker hair, some have lighter hair, you know, there's all of these different ways that humans um, vary. And these these things, these variations, these variations are things that are potential explanations for that first question, somebody's going to die, who's going to die? And so in some environments, as we're going to get to, the fastest animals are the ones that are able to survive, and the slower ones are the ones that are going to die. And so we find that this variability is going to be in a huge part of the uh, theory of evolution. Uh, going back, by the way, I've, I forgot about the, I said the principles of genetics, nobody knew them, but uh, it was well established that as a general rule, uh, children tended to resemble their um, parents. They tended to. Of course, there's, again, many exceptions to the rule, but there's a general tendency. Um, as I said, Darwin did not understand why this was true, but he understood it was true, and that's really all he needed to make his series work. Um, and so, uh, nah, I don't want to do mutations. This was another point where Darwin was less than awesome. He, um, he overemphasized the role of mutations in his work. Uh, mutations do, in fact, play some role in evolution, but very little, very little. Um, so anyway, the question was, somebody's going to uh, die. In every environment, there's always going to be more animals than the environment can uh, sustain, and some of them will die. Who's going to die? And that, that natural variability that is found in all populations of organisms is going to be the thing that determines, I mean, some aspect of it. Like I said, with humans, some have darker hair, some have lighter hair, some are taller, some are shorter, some are, I mean, some, one of these variability things is going to be the thing, Okay. And so, natural selection is the evolutionary by process by which heritable traits that best enable organisms to survive and reproduce in particular environments will uh, are passed to ensuing generations. Okay, and so we find that okay we've we've added the word um, genetics in here, but really those organisms that have physical characteristics that to allow them to survive. In some environments, as I said, it's being fast. The fastest survive and the slowest do not. And it's not the being fast that passes along, but it's the genetic material. Remember, uh, babies tend to resemble parents. It's the genetic material inside of that organism which allowed it to create the behavioral characteristic of fast, which is what is being passed along. Okay, And so the, beha the, the genes which code for slowness, are being, <coughs> right? They're gone from the, the next generation. All right. Whew. A lot of words. Um, so evolution 
is by definition the change in the trace of a population of organisms from one generation to the next. Um, the change in the a or the the change in the average. In other words, evolution is. Um, let's go back to the silly giraffes and say, okay, let's say all of the giraffes are born. You know, in fact. By the way, if you go into the fossil record and you dig them out, giraffes did in fact used to have short necks. That's a fact. And um, so you got a bunch of short necked giraffes running around looking silly. And what happens though is there's going to be some variability. Some giraffes, though they're all pretty short, some are a little bit longer and some are a little bit shorter. Those that happen to have the longer necks are the ones that are able to reach a little bit higher on the trees and get a little bit more food and survive through the next time there's a problem. Okay? Lo and behold, those though they're all short neck, those with the shortest necks, in fact, are the ones that are going to survive to the next, or with the longest necks are the ones that are going to survive to the next generation and pass along characteristics for long necks. And in the next generation, the average giraffe length neck length will be slightly longer than it was the generation before. Okay? Slightly longer. And every generation, there's going to be a selective pressure. Those with the longest necks have the ability to reach the most food, and therefore they have the most pressure. However, just having a long neck is not necessarily advantageous because along with having the, the ability to reach higher branches on a tree, it also has an uh, increased probability of snapping off, right? I mean, the longer your neck is, the more likely you could choke and die or something like this. And so there are, uh, there are pressures on both directions, uh, and, and that's where giraffe length, neck lengths have evolved to. Now we can talk about this. Um, we can talk about the length of a giraffe's neck, but we already sort of hinted about the fact that evolution does not just select for physical characteristics, but it also affects uh, behavioral characteristics, like how fast you can run, okay, or um, you know uh, what kinds of food you prefer, or um, uh, what kind of uh, mates do you select, or something. And so we find that um, evolutionary psychology is the study of evolution of behavior using the principles of natural selection. And it presumably favors genes that predispose behavioral tendencies and information processing systems that solve adaptive problems faced by our ancestors. So it turns out that, uh, let's say, for example, cooperation is something which was selected by our, you know, our ancestors. Those of our ancestors that demonstrated cooperation were more likely to survive than those of our ancestors that did not demonstrate cooperation. Therefore, the act, the genetic material which codes for cooperativeness is more likely to be passed along to the next generation. Okay, so that's a kind of a, a funky way to say it. Uh, so the slow gradual changes seen in evolution are really not that controversial, okay? Uh, some people will say evolution is a fact, and some people will say evolution is a theory. And the answer is both, okay? Because um, evolution is a fact in the sense that animals do in fact change across time. That was literally the definition of evolution, the change in the average characteristics of a species across time. You see, now that was the definition I was looking for. And, um... That is, a, I, I mean, all you got to do is just dig out fossils and see that, you know, they used to all be short-necked giraffes, and now they're long-necked giraffes. Okay, duh, they do change. That's a fact. That's evolution. The question then, though, is evolution a theory, is a question of what is the force that is driving that selection. And it, I'm not getting into a lot of it here, but one of the explanations for what is making these changes happen is of course natural selection but there's also other forces too such as sexual selection that is to say uh, women make have preferences for who they mate with and they can choose characteristics that they like okay um, there's uh, uh, some strong beliefs that blue eyes are in fact um, a freak you know uh, blue eyes literally is a lack of pigmentation. That's what it is. It's not blue per se, but what it is is um, all humans are supposed to have brown eyes, but there was a freaky mutation where um, the amount of pigmentation in the eyes was quite low, and what you're seeing is not blue per se, but you're seeing um, the red from the blood vessels behind it kind of creeping through because there's not enough... Um, the, the, the colors, the brown and the red are kind of mixing together to make a bluish. I don't know how the hell that is. Ask your artist friends. But 
that's what's happening is a lack of pigmentation is allowing the redness from the eye, the blood, uh, I guess it's blue, right? You look under your skin, there you go, it's blue. The blueness from the, the blood to, to show through. Okay, that's right, I heard that rumor. Until blood, uh, until blood touches oxygen, it's blue, right? And then once it touches oxygen, it becomes red, whatever. So how could such a stupid thing survive and it was very simple because women preferred it women said that's pretty i like that and they were more likely to mate with that man that had the blue eyes it did not have the natural selection it's not like they lived or died and therefore they couldn't have babies no women preferred it so we could talk about a lot of different ways that evolution runs so evolution is a fact animals do change and evolution is a theory what is it that's driving that change couple of different explanations are natural selection, sexual selection, but a major part of it, in fact, with human beings is um, artificial selection. Say, for example, wolves turning into dogs, that's something that we humans have done, okay? We have done that. So we select for those characteristics that we prefer, or uh, a cow, the average cow puts out like 20 gallons of milk nowadays, but if you go back um, a couple thousand years, the average cow put out like two cups a day. How the hell did we do that? Because every time Farmer Brown's wife said, hey, dude, it's time for a steak dinner, Farmer Brown's like, Betsy makes two cups of milk a day and Elsie makes three. Which one of these is going to be steak dinner? It's like, duh, drop, you're going you're gonna to eat the one that only makes two cups, right? And so Farmer Brown naturally, he, or artificially selected for, he, art, uh, Farmer Brown was the environment that made the decision about who lived and who died. Um, but anyway, the... The uh, the slow gradual change you're seeing in evolution are generally not that controversial. Like uh, nobody has a problem with the fact that my little Shih Tzu could uh, have babies with a Great Dane if they it was what they wanted to do, right? Because um, that's nothing. They're, it's just still this dog is a dog. They, you made him look different. So what? A dog is a dog. But where evolution becomes very controversial is the act of speciation. Speciation is the act of actually changing from one species to another. Okay, and that's where the controversy comes from. There are other explanations, by the way, of course, for um, how the world works. You know, creationism and intelligent design are two um, other uh, theories which help to explain the way the world is today. Um, I, I am not sure how to respond to that. Take that to your Sunday school teacher. Um, so, under the assumption that all humans share a common uh, genetic heritage, and in fact, um, there's uh, there's a lot of different types of, you know, you know, in your genetic material, one of the things inside of there is called mitochondrial DNA. Um, the majority of your, your DNA, of course, you know what happens is um, mom throws some in, dad throws some in, do -do 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 -do, let's do a dance, yippee doo right? These chromosomes mix and all kinds of happy shit comes out. But there's one part of that genetic material called mitochondrial DNA, which is somewhat unique because it only comes from your mom. It does not come from anybody else, okay? Therefore, your mitochondrial DNA should be copy and paste exactly the same as your mother's. Copy and paste exactly the same as her mother's. Copy and paste the same as her mother's. You got it? Should be exactly the same. However, now we'll pull out that notion of mutations, accidental changes. And this mitochondrial DNA, it's like a photocopier. When you photocopy, it becomes a little bit different, right? It's pretty much the same, but it's not perfect replication. There's little blips and stuff. Well, this, uh, the mutations in the mitochondrial DNA are occurring at a pretty predictable rate. And so what happens is, though your mitochondrial DNA should be exactly the same as your mother's and grandma's and great-grandma's, there are there is a, no, a uh, predictable rate at which it's different. Not very much, of course, but by looking at the mitochondrial DNA of any two people. So we grab me and we grab you and we whip out our mitochondrial DNA. <laughs> we toss out our mitochondrial DNA and uh, lo and behold, what's going to happen is we can look at how different they are and make a pretty good estimation for the last time you and I shared a grandmother. Okay, only on the female side, remember, we, we don't know what's going on in the father's side. We can go backwards and find out the last time that we shared a female ancestor. Likewise, we can do this and we find for any, uh, the, the, uh, for all of the people on the planet, the difference was only something around 100,000 years. I, I don't remember and I just closed up on my screen where I could see it. It is this one. 
I think it was like a hundred thousand years ago or something that we shared. Yeah, a hundred thousand years ago. There you go. Um, that our we have a a grandmother in common. One hundred thousand years ago, all human beings on this planet share a genetic Eve, is what we call them. So that's why I put the little Garden of Eden and Eve in there. You know, somewhere in Africa there is we shared a grandmother, Lucy, right? A Lucy grandma. And um, using this mitochondrial DNA, they can uh, then then assess human migration patterns. But the point is, 100,000 years ago, we were exactly the same. And since, as we already know, um, uh, children tend to resemble their parents, children, you know, children tend to resemble their grandparents, children, so clearly we share an awful lot in common. All right, so now, I want to point this out. This is this is a really uh, important graph because I'm going to be using it here to describe something. But um, the same basic idea can be used over and over and over across these courses. I mean, across any of your psych courses. In fact, this is going to be um, a very very big point. So I'm going to kind of try to explain it without the ability to point at it. Uh, tricky. I'm pointing. You're not looking. Uh oh. All right. So let's say the phenotype, by the way, is um, it's the way something is expressed. Okay. The phenotype. Let's say um, uh, the way something looks. Uh, let's say group A is uh, women and group B is men. Okay. Something like that. And this phenotype is um, muscles. Okay. Muscularity. Ha. Huh. Ooh. Something like that. Okay. So how much? muscles you got and so group B the men are um, they have more muscles than the women okay right you see this but you see that within let's say the men there's a large amount of diversity there are some men that have very few muscles and there are some men that have very many muscles right and so there's this nice spread but look to the women too okay we find that uh, w there are some women that are more muscular than than other women some are, are less muscular than other women etc Okay, so we find that there is uh, diversity within each group, as, as we said there would be, right? There's diversity everywhere. And at the same time, though, we find that um, the average man, that dashed line running up the middle of group B picture, is in fact higher than the average woman. Okay, so given this notion, okay, there is a truth to the statement, men are more muscular than women. But at the same time, you see, because of this, uh, the amount of overlap, that there are plenty of members of Group A, in this case women, that are in fact more muscular than many members of Group B. Okay? So what we got here, in fact, this is a stereotype, but yet it's a truthotype. I don't know if that's a word. We'll come back to stereotypes later, but here's how it goes, okay? There is a truth. Men are more muscular than women. At the same time, there is a hundred and fifty thousand billion exceptions to the rule. There's so much overlap, so it, something can be both true and untrue. As a general rule, what you find is the size of the diversity within the group. You see the spread of um, the group B. Uh, you see those little, the little thin line there. This is quite large. You see how wide that is, and you look at how small the difference is between the group averages. So clearly. There's a truth to this statement that is also untrue. So now this is this is interesting because it, it kind of points out a couple of things. It, it it emphasizes our genetic heritage. So if we change group A and group B to be um, um, Kenyans, people from you know people from um, sub uh, from Kenya and people from Iceland or something. I mean it's the furthest I can imagine pulling them apart. And um, you find that this is what you would find. Okay. Um, Within the Kenyan people, there would be a lot of diversity. Within the Icelandic people, there would be a lot of diversity. There would be some truth that people from Kenya are, in fact, different than people from Iceland. That There would be a truth there. But that truth would be that relatively small difference between these group averages. There would be more diversity within each group than there is between those groups. Okay. Now, I want to keep this one in mind later because, uh, in particular, when we talk about stereotypes... Every stereotype in the world could be could be plotted onto this graph, okay? And so we need to kind of make sure we, we dig this idea that um, a statement can be both true and untrue. 
men are more muscular than women. It is both true as a group average and untrue in the sense that there are thousands and millions of ex exceptions to the rule. All right, so here's some more cultural, uh, universal stuff, okay? Paul Ekman went and he had these people stage these, these pictures. Um, he said, oh, okay, I want you to, to show these emotions. And then he took them around and people said, oh, okay, I can. And so it's like, okay, in the top, you know, starting in the top left with the adults, the top left, she's happy. Second one, scared, surprised, take a surprise, duh, surprised. Third one, scared. Fourth one, sad. Fifth one, angry. Fifth, uh, sixth one, disgusted. Okay. And so we, we find that um, we as humans, this is a universal thing. If you take these two, um, in fact, he did. He took these to uh, Papua New Guinea to some tribes people that had very little um, interaction with, with uh, American people and American cultures and stuff. And lo and behold, um, the Papua New Guineans were able to read these no problem. And then he said to these Papua New Guineans, and he said, um, why don't you... And then he had, had them pose happy and scared and sad. He brought them back to America, and the Americans had no problem at all reading his emotions. Okay, There is some cultural uh, amounts uh, stuck to it. The way an American smiles is different than a way a, a New Guinean smiles. But it's still the same basic underlying thing. And in fact, you take a look down at the bottom and look at these babies. Okay? Um, these babies are expressing those same emotions, but you can't tell them to pose it, okay? So the first baby is obviously happy, the second one is pissed off, the third one is interested, the fourth one is disgusted, the fifth one is su surprised, and the sixth one is sad, okay? And so, uh, and then there's one more underneath there who is scared. Oh my, she really is scared, isn't she? Woo! <laughs> All right, whatever. Uh, so these things are universal. These are across the board. Okay. Remember, the point of this chapter is, uh, in fact, this whole unit was, um, you might think that you make your own choices, but in fact, there are social pressures, there are pressures, in this case, biological pressures, that are saying, no, you don't make your own choices. Okay? Uh, yeah, that's a good one, but let's go on. Um, I don't want to get, I just want to say, basically, what this comes down to is, um, language is universal. I mean, of course, each, every culture has their own language, but we all have the potential to speak all languages. Um, we are born with, uh, a language center. I kind of want to, see, the, the point behind some of this stuff is I want to talk about cultural universals. Those things that are across all cultures, they pop out, Okay. That is to say, um, there are certain aspects of culture which show up everywhere in the world. And if they show up everywhere in the world, that's a strong suspicion. The reason they keep showing up everywhere in the world is there's biology that's making it happen. Okay? And so, this is good stuff, but it's, this is the wrong class for it. You know, it's good stuff. Oh, here, this is a good one. I like this one. Uh, across 30 cultures, people were asked to assign adjectives belonging to males or females. I can't remember. I mean, it was a pretty elaborate study. They went and um, they gave hundreds of words. And uh, they, they gave out hundreds of words and then they said to people, okay, I want you to take each word and assign it to men or women. Okay? And then they had some criterion like um, uh, it, within one population, three quarters of the people must assign it to a gender before we will say this culture has assigned it to a gender. And so, of course, many words were eliminated from, from the list this way. And then they said, um, uh, in order for a word to be considered universal, then something like 25 out of these 30 cultures must have assigned it as such. So it's a pretty, pretty strict criteria. And lo and behold, um, here, here's, on the next slide here, I have it. These are the words that um, came up with, with men. These were man words, okay? Universally, men are rated as more adventurous, dominant, forceful, independent, okay? It goes on and on. Coarse, cruel, inventive, logical, clear thinking, okay? And so these are all um, severe, rude, lazy, loud. Loud? Men are loud? No. That's just a stereotype. Wait a minute. If that's just a stereotype, then guess what we could do with that rude or loud or something? 
we could go back to here and we could say change the word phenotype to how loud they are and we could find that each and every one of the words on this list could be graphed on this picture okay that is what's going on these are stereotypes but this is where stereotypes are graphed out women now if men are loud right and I'm gonna take loud I'll own it I'll own it we're reckless and stolid and confident women are more sentimental and emotional and submissive and dependent and attractive and meek and shy and gentle and curious and all oh, and talkative all right you got to take the good with the bad all right you take it you got it all right so these are really quite interesting um the fact that these are universal again implies that there is biology at its core okay though they are they're culturally universal um, according to C.S. Lewis another cultural universal which also seems to have its root in I don't know I mean I will say somebody put it there do we say evolution selected for it or do we say that God put it there I, I am not going to argue I am just going to say that um, <coughs> Type. According to C.S. Lewis, people have a, a standard of behavior, a morality, to which they expect other people to adhere. You know, this um, morality that we guide, that guides our behavior. The simplest way to describe this, and I mean, I, I'm simplifying, you know, just tremendous body of work here. The simplest thing is um, this uh, gut level feeling. It's, it's very similar to... Um, 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 uh, Freud's concept of the superego, right, guiding us. But this internal morality, this internal moral compass, this, um, this internal sense of right and wrong. Uh, many people say that morality is culturally based, you know. Uh, but C.S. Lewis says, no, 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 that's bullshit. Um, if you say morality is culturally based, you're denying. You're denying what's really going on. He says what's really going on is that we all have the same internal moral compass. We all have the same sense of right and wrong. God put it there, according to C.S. Lewis. And the, the thing is, though, I mean, God also gave us the ability to ignore that, okay? Just because you know right from wrong doesn't mean you have to follow it. Okay, and according to C.S. Lewis, anybody that says uh, morality is culturally based is is basically just saying I'm ignoring my internal moral compass, or I'm I'm pretending I'm smarter than God, or something like this. Okay, um, and so this this is I I've, I'm a big fan of this. I I um I think it's true. Um, I really do. I, I a couple of years back. Uh, in Dallas, there was a uh, Middle Eastern family, I don't remember where from, and um, these daughters were uh, dating American men, and uh, the father was just uh, furious. He was just outraged. He, he he had lost his family honor. He could not imagine how he could ever possibly get his family honor back, and so he, he drives his car and kills him. He just runs him over with his car. I mean, however, what comes next is the most interesting. Some would argue that... Um, this honor killing was um it's part of his culture it's what he 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 had to do to retain his honor blah 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 well guess what c.s lewis would say no he knew it was wrong he knew deep down in his heart it was wrong even when he did it okay and lo and behold what did this guy do as soon as he uh runs over his daughter he disappears he runs away he goes into the deepest darkest hole he can possibly find and is consumed with guilt because he knows he just knows it's wrong Okay, I cannot possibly believe there is a culture that possibly says that it's acceptable, not just acceptable, but but um, it, it is a positive thing to kill your own children. I just, I can't believe that. Uh, okay, yeah, there are other biological influences, not just genetics, but um, hormones or chemical imbalances. So there's other things out there that also constrain us. Um, I like this. This is I'm going to try to kind of connect together um, evolution with culture here. According to evolutionary theory, physical isolation of a population can lead to rapid speciation due to different selective pressures from different environments. That is to say, if you have beetles, right, and you've got this big population of beetles and they're all happy, and then a river pops up. 
boing, that's how rivers happen. And this river comes up and uh, it splits this group of beetles in half. Very, very quickly, the beetles on the left side and the beetles on the right side of the river will become so different from each other that uh, they will no longer be able to have babies with each other. That's what speciation is all about. Okay, very quickly they, they will become a different species of beetle. Now this is how you know when you isolate populations, they um, there's different pressures, different selections. You know, on the left side of the river there's more rain, and on the right side of the river there's less rain because of the way that rain travels across. And so there's different pressures to select which beetles live and which beetles die, etc. Okay. Well, if you isolate a human population, it's the same kind of a thing. There's different selective pressures in different environments. Now, humans are, are not purely biologically driven. We, we're pretty smart creatures. But what happens is that all humans in all environments have to solve a few basic problems. And the basic problems that arise are uh, you got to find food, you got to find shelter, you got to find a woman. Okay? And in different environments, we have to devise different plans to make it happen. Okay? And so when you isolate a human population, there are different selective pressures, and the solution to these problems in a different environment is what we call culture. That's what culture is. Okay? The solutions to the different problems faced by people in different environments. Um, human behavior, I like this, this is good. Human behavior is less restricted by genetics and more subject to learning and experience than other animals. Don't get me wrong, we are biological creatures at our core, but we um, we have uh, the ability to uh, our, our brains are way bigger. I mean, I, I go take your bio psych class. I mean, our brains are just just kick ass bigger. Um, you will find humans. Humans is the only species that you will find in all geographic areas of the earth. You will find them at the, at the poles. You'll find them in you know Canada and come down to America and Mexico and at the equator and you know every single place that you could possibly live. Humans live there. Um, no other animal can do that because no other animal has, uh, or most other animals rely so much more heavily on biology than humans do that um, biology imposes upon them certain behaviors. Say, for example, um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, an Arctic fox has certain behaviors and characteristics which uh, really ideally suit it to live in the Arctic, okay? It's got white fur so it blends in with the uh, snow so it can't be seen. And... Uh, when it gets cold, it's got particular behavioral traits, like um, it digs in a little snow cave, <laughs> you know, it makes a little snow cave, and it's happy and shit like that. Um, and so it's got particular particular characteristics which help it to survive in its unique environment. Now, to grab a snow fox and bring it down to Texas and drop it into Texas, and you know what you got? Number one, it's nice white fur, which used to be a really good survival thing, makes it a giant target out there into the Texas desert. And uh, guess what? His little snow cave ability digging thing, it's really going to come in handy out on the hard hard, uh, hard pan dirt, you know? So poor stupid fox is going to be ego food just like that, okay? Now you take a human from Texas and you drop him up into the Arctic. Admittedly, we don't have a lot of biology to help us there, but guess what? We have culture to help us there. We have brains and the ability to learn and to adapt to help us up there. And so we will take a gun, shoot the damn fox, and make ourselves a fur coat, and we'll be just fine, right? That's how it works. That's what humans have done, okay? Uh, we're still biological creatures. Don't even. Don't even go there. But we are more subject, or we, we, we are more able to modify our environments and ourselves to fit. By definition, culture is the enduring behaviors, ideas, attitudes, and traditions shared by a large group of people and transmitted from one generation to the next. The culture that you grew up with will influence the way that you behave. That is the point of this entire unit. Here, do you think it is wrong for unmarried couples to bear children? In India, they're like, oh yeah, that is so wrong. Nobody should do that. But if you go all the way to the far extreme there underneath my face, you find Iceland. And in Iceland, they're like, oh, everybody should have babies. No problem. Moms and dads and couples and cousins. And it doesn't matter. Anybody can have a baby, right? So clearly, this type of an attitude is something that is that is per, uh, permeating their culture. And of course, this type of an attitude, will, it, which comes from our culture, will in fact influence us um, in other ways as well.
Uh, some countries have very little cultural diversity uh, within the culture. There's very there, everybody's pretty much the same, as in Japan in particular. Um, in Japan, they they have they have like an ethnic minority in Japan. You wouldn't even know it. I mean, you'd look at them and you're like, how is this person different from this person? And they would know it, right? They would know it. There are certain physical characteristics different, and these ethnic um, they are, are are so isolated, they're never allowed to become part of the majority culture. If you are not a full-fledged Japanese, and in fact, they, they just don't accept um, a lot of... Uh, there, there's, there's people, that, there's some evidence showing that when people move to Japan, they just never fit in. The Japanese people do not welcome them. They just, they just don't want cultural diversity in Japan. They like the way they are, and they want to keep it that way. Some countries have a lot of cultural diversity. America is an, a really, really diverse country. Um, all you got to do is look around um, our classroom up at Wesleyan, and, and you'll see a rainbow sitting there. And... Um, from all all different parts of the world and that I mean that that's who we are our country is being shaped by all of this okay um, well what are some of the things that might possibly be shaped by culture how we define beauty okay yeah um, how we define social justice what is fair and what is not fair um, w whether we tend to be expressive or reserved in our social interactions with others so, I mean this this notion of what is it based on culture is pretty broad. I mean, it, it would really, it could really incorporate a lot of things. So again, I remind you, I make my own choices. No, you don't. Okay, you think you do. You think you're in charge of your behavior or something, but you're not. You're being influenced by these unseen social forces or unseen forces. Right. That was the whole point of this chapter. Norms are standards for accepted and expected behavior. Norms prescribe what is proper behavior, what is correct, what is good. Okay? Um, as an interesting example, norms for punctuality change with time and place. I can tell you, I, uh, I get kind of annoyed. I get, okay, no, no, not kind of annoyed. I get very annoyed about the norms for punctuality in Texas because shit nine o'clock class means I don't know roll in at 920 some shit like that you know something no nine means 855 you be there so that you have your pencil out and your books open and you're ready to go okay that's what nine o'clock means and um, I grew up in a different part of the country and in a different part of the country the norms were in fact different okay personal space is another example of uh, subject to culture, the buffer zone we like to maintain. Um, again, I uh, I grew up in a culture which had a fairly large personal space, um, and I'm married to a woman from Korea, and Korean people tend to have much, much, much smaller personal space, and uh, therefore when we go up to the church, it's a really kind of an uncomfortable experience because... Um, they just don't have the same same um, personal space issues, and so they are constantly bumping you and pushing you and getting in close to you. And there is no place you can stand in that church. There are definitely times when when you just there's no place you can get. You just you think you found a spot where you're not going to be bumped and put. There is not a spot that you can go. And um, American people just wouldn't do it that way. So here's a really cute cartoon. I like this. Women, that we're talking about a norm now, a, a, a cultural norm. Women kiss women goodnight. That's a cultural norm. You can do that. That's expected. It's proper behavior. Men kiss women goodnight. Okay, that's accepted. That's proper behavior. But men do not kiss men goodnight, especially in Armonk. Okay, I don't know what Armonk is, but I'm envisioning this to be something like Connecticut. All right, so it's like. Not only is it not acceptable for men to kiss men, but it really is not acceptable in Armonk, okay? So, clearly what she's saying is there are two social norms here which are perfectly acceptable, one which is not, and one which is really, really not because of where we're at, okay? So, these norms do, in fact, influence our behaviors. Oh, this was a neat study. Um, this was really cool. They did this one in Japan and America, um, and it was the same basic, uh, same basic experiment done in both places, but the results that came out were radically different. So what we have here, and it, it, it's, a, 
it's a poor uh, it's a bad it's a bad uh, copy but what we have here is um, a participant at the top there it's a participant participant is just walking down the sidewalk la di da minding their own business we see on the right side it says confederate this confederate is approaching the participant okay the confederate as they pass the participant will do one of three things the, per the confederate will either avoid eye contact or glance at the person that's walking down the sidewalk or look at that person and smile at them okay these participants that's a silly word they're just people walking down the street okay and so this confederate is going to do one of those three things the observer at the back who does not know does not know what the confederate is doing does not know if they're avoiding glance at this point or uh, or avoiding their or avoiding their look or glancing at them or smiling okay they don't know and so the observer at the back is going to be watching that participant to find out if they smile or not and so lo and behold in America let's take a look if the confederate approaches and avoids eye contact with a the participant there's a very small chance like eight percent that that participant will smile if the confederate approaches and glances at the participant there is about a twenty percent chance that that participant will smile if the confederate approaches and looks and smiles there's about a forty to fifty percent chance that that participant will smile okay they do now do the exact same study in japan and guess what if you avoid eye contact they don't smile at you if you glance at them they don't smile at you if you look at them and smile they don't smile at you. That's what a norm is about. A norm in Japan is you do not interact with other people out in public. Okay? They just don't exist to you. Okay? Um, there's some other norms, though, that seem to be more universally based. And um, universally based norms are, again, probably a reflection of um, some biological underlying truth. Um, Universal friendship norms are respecting privacy, making eye contact while talking to another. Um, you don't divulge things that are said in confidence. These are just things universally that are norms for friendship. We find that uh, the big five social traits, I'm not a big fan, of, uh, big, I don't really understand these all that well. Uh, the big five social beliefs work well all over the world. I don't even know what that means. Blah, blah, blah. What, I don't know what that means. Um, some other things, wherever people form status hierarchies, and that's pretty much everywhere, um, they talk to a higher status people in a respectful way that's different from the way they talk to strangers. In some cultures, they in fact have um, uh, two forms of language. They have the honor honors form, uh, the honor form of language and the regular form of language. Um, it's actually very interesting when my wife meets a new person from Korea, a new Korean person, within a minute or two of each other, um, they're going to figure out who in, in their in their culture is really age uh, that really sets the status uh, status apart, and so very quickly they're going to they're going to figure out who is older than who, and then the younger person is going to use the honors form of language in, almost immediately. It's just it going to just happen. It just comes out that way. Okay, in Amer in English we don't have a. Uh, quite as formalized dis distinction but uh, hopefully when you're talking to me uh, as a professor you're probably talking to me different than you are when you're talking to your friends I mean you're using different words you're perhaps less likely to drop an f-bomb in my presence perhaps I don't know uh, but hopefully it, it, something's a little di different okay um, the incest taboo is universal nowhere is it acceptable for moms and sons to you know what uh, so anyway, there's other norms. All right, so now let, let's break it down. Um, gender. Let's talk gender. Gender is an interesting case. It's a very, very, very major part. Uh, it's a major thing that you're bringing into social situations, or it is a major thing that is influencing the way you behave around other people. Okay, and gender, of course, has both a biology to it and a cultural, so a nature and a nurture to it. The characteristics, whether biological or socially influenced, which, by which people define male or female. Okay, there is a truth. Um, again, though, all of these truths could be graphed on that same type of picture we had before. Compared with males, the average female has 70% more body fat, 
40% less muscle is 5 inches shorter and weighs 40 pounds less. Okay. Compared with males, the average female is more sensitive to smells and sounds. Uh, the average female is doubly vulnerable to anxiety disorders and depression. Uh, compared with females, the average male is uh, slower to enter puberty by about two years, but quicker to die by about four years. Oh, shit, I got that look forward to. Uh, three times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, four times more likely to commit suicide. Five times more likely to be struck by lightning. That's an easy one. You know why men are struck by lightning more often? Because they're idiots. They get on the roof in a, in a storm to fix the antenna. Or go golfing in the rain. What a dumbass. Okay. Uh, men are more likely to be capable of wiggling their ears. I have no idea what the hell that means or why I would want to know that, but it's true. Um, of course, gender. We, we know very briefly that um, in our genetic makeup, we've got uh, 20, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, 22 of those pairs are fairly evenly matched. But there is one pair, the last pair, the 23rd pair, which is um, a little bit funky. And we know that on that 23rd pair of chromosomes, there are two, uh, what, do you, what do you call those then? Uh, whatever, X's and Y's. Uh, chromosome, yeah, the chromosomes, I guess, yeah. Well, what happens is when, when dad and mom are uh, making a baby, um, they both contribute either an X or a Y. Uh, to the game. The problem is, is mom, who uh, has an XX inside of her, when she contributes to the game, will always contribute an X, because that's all she's got to contribute. Dad has got an X and a Y to contribute to this game. So, dad might contribute the X, and dad might contribute the Y. And if, you know, mom gives an X, mom will give an X, uh, if, you know. But if mom gives an X and dad gives an X, then the baby will come out to be a girl. We'll talk about that. If mom gives an X and dad gives a Y, the baby will come out to be a boy. Again, I don't know. What, what does that really mean? Okay. Um, and so there are, uh, what, what this tells us is that uh, Henry VIII, who kept chopping off his wife's heads because they couldn't have a son, maybe he ought to have been chopping off his own head, eh? Uh-huh. Silly, silly Billy. Um, we find that um, if... A baby has an XY chromosome set up, then it will most likely trigger that baby that baby's body to stimulate more testosterone, to produce more testosterone. That's what will happen if a developing fetus has. And so um, this testosterone comes out early and it in fact makes the um, the boys make a wiener, right? Um, it's kind of a funky thing. All babies are uh, start out as girls. All all infants start out. Female is the um, the 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 the, the ba whatever the base that all ba humans started as. If this developing fetus has an X Y chromosome set up, then they will develop into a boy. But uh, by default, they will develop into a girl. All babies will become girls unless certain things happen at certain times. All right, whatever. Um, both males and females have testosterone, but really males have so much more. And uh, it, it stimulates the changes at puberty and things of that nature. But that testosterone also seems to be responsible for aggression. And again, going back to, um, going back to uh, uh, evolutionary theory, um, men have more to gain from aggression than women do, right? Um, because women are very selective. They can choose who they want to uh, mate with. Men, on the other hand, are always competing for the women. And so in, in the game of competition to pass along my genetic material to the next generation, um, aggression is a very beneficial thing for males, okay? Uh, men are more likely to show physical aggression, but once you get to more... Uh, Relational aggression, women. Oof. All right, a role. I, we briefly talked about roles at one other point, but a role is a set of expectations or norms, really, right? Things that are normal, things that you're supposed to do if you're in a social position. Defining how those in a position ought to behave. One type of role. I mean, you could have a role. My role is a father. Trust me, there are certain behaviors that I'm supposed to exhibit because I'm a father. But then there's also gender roles. So... 
a set of behaviors that is expected. If you're a male, then this is what's expected of you. This is the way you should behave. If you're a female, this is how it's expected to. And again, this is going to be culturally different. Some cultures, gender roles ask men to be this way, and some ask them to be that way. Okay. Uh, gender identity, gender typing. Uh, all right. So, where does being a boy or a girl come from? First off, I want to I want to break this before I even get into this social learning and gender schema theory. There was this really interesting study they did with um, uh, monkeys. With I think they were rhesus macaques. I don't remember, but uh, they took these infant monkeys. They were maybe six months old. You know, um, they had never ever been exposed to culture cultural expectations about what boys and girls were supposed to do and they had never gone to the toy store and saw the pink aisle and you know, none of these things had happened and so what happens was they threw them in a room hopefully they didn't throw them right they put them in a room with a bunch of toys some were uh, real stereotypical boy toys you know Tonka trucks and things like that and some were real stereotypical soft toys okay and so they threw these monkeys in there, and uh, it didn't. It, it worked out pretty interesting. When the um, the boy monkeys were put in the room full of toys, the boys preferred the truck kinds of things, but they definitely were not averse to the um, soft toys. They 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 were okay with the soft toys too. They they liked both the hard and the soft toys with a preference for the harder boy stuff. Throwing the baby girl monkeys, and the baby girl monkeys didn't want anything to do with the Tonka trucks. They just did not want those things with the hard surfaces and the, the pokes at the edges and the corners like this. They wanted the soft, cuddly things. They instantly went for the soft baby, the soft baby doll things, and and just cuddled with them and stuff. So the boy monkeys showed less preferences, but preferred slightly the the boy toys. And the girl monkeys far, far, far preferred the girl toys. So the idea is even before I get into this whole, um, we're teaching our children to be boys and girls, there's a biological truth to it. It's it's in there somewhere, okay? So anyway, part of, part of becoming, part of our identity of being a boy or a girl, part of our understanding of the role, what is my role of being a man and where does it come from? Part of it does come from social learning theory, the, th the theory that we learn by uh, our social behavior by observing and imitating and being rewarded and punished. Um, that that uh, my, so my, my son learns, I mean, in fact, I, I uh, take my job very seriously to teach my son to be a man. That, that's my job because it doesn't just happen normally, uh, naturally. So I have to reward and punish certain behaviors. Um, hopefully not punish, but, you know, I have to encourage certain behaviors. I have to... Um, model certain behaviors so that he can observe it. I have him imitate my behaviors, okay? Um, my son needs to learn how to, say, mow the lawn. My son needs to learn how to fix a window, whatever it might be, okay? Has to work it out this way. Gender schema theory is a little bit different. I believe we talked about a schema at some point in here. I can't remember when, but if you recall very briefly, a schema was a mental representation of how something is supposed to be. Remember, we said you could have a schema. In fact, we did it when we talked about memory. And we, I remember we talked about our memories and how the schema will guide our um, our future memories. Well, imagine having a schema for being what it means to be a boy, okay? And therefore, if once you have this schema, it, it gives you a general framework upon which you can then make decisions about your future behaviors, okay? So it's kind of a neat idea. Uh, look at the little girl. Okay, whatever. Uh, clearly our, um, gender roles have changed with time. Um, here is the percentage, this is within America, the percentage agreeing that the activities of married women are best confined to home and family. In 1967, by far the majority of men believed that, uh, but in 1967 a whole hell of a lot of women believed it too, Okay. You see those numbers dropped considerably down to 20% or so for women. This was um, clearly, uh, that, that drop is it corresponds to women's lib, burn your bra, you know, death to the man, some shit like that. And uh, we see there are s s little peaks and valleys, but as a general rule, it's, it's flattened off. Men, about 30% of men still believe this, and about 20% of women still believe this. But that number has come down dramatically, okay? So our notion of gender roles has changed dramatically. But 
uh, again, these these gender roles, the same basic kind of a question, is um, uh, changes across different cultures. So take a look. What kind of marriage do you think is the more satisfying way of life? One where both uh, the the couple, you know, well, the the purple one, a traditional man provides, woman stays home. Okay, we see that um, even in the United States, 37% of people say, you know what, I think it would the best kind of marriage is one where the woman stays home. But if you get out to Egypt, 66% of them say, you know what, the woman should stay home. And um, some cultures like Peru, they're like, nah, women don't have to stay home. Look at that, 13% are up in France. They're like, nah, women get out there and work. Earn me a, my money, woman, something. Uh, but we find that the answers to this question by these different cultures are uh, an indication of the different gender roles that are felt by these different cultures. Okay, so we can talk about the nurture of gender, right? The the environment that we grow up in. This one is one of my favorites. I love this. Um, this is this makes you rethink biology. This is funky, man. This is a, a worm, a worm that lives in the sea, and uh, it's a very unique. It has a very unique environment. It has its own little niche. It lives on the bones of dead whales. That's it. That, its entire existence is on the bones of dead whales. You will not find them anywhere else in the world. And so what happens is these... these um, these uh, when when they when they have babies, they shoot the babies out, right, and then they float down to land on the you know to land on the whale. If they land on a whale bone, what happens is they develop in the females. However, if they land on top of a female that's already there, it gets absorbed into the female's body and it develops into a male. The male is nothing but a sperm sac. That's it. You see the little rice crispy over there? That's kind of creepy. The male develops into a little tiny sperm sac inside of the female. So here's the deal. What does it mean to be a boy or a girl? XX or XY? Except, look, when these babies are born, they're all completely unsexed. And the environment that they land into, in other words, is gender, nature, or nurture? And you're like, XXXY, dude, nature, you know? And then you could talk about gender roles, nurture, etc. But this is all nurture, 100% nurture, because the biology is absolutely and utterly set to be both male and female. It just depends on which environment they land in, on a whalebone or on top of a female. What crazy world is that? Osidax Frank Presai. That's pretty cool. All right, so now, ha, what is this? I don't know, other things. Okay, empathy is a vicarious experience of another's feelings, putting oneself in another's shoes. In fact, look, if we're talking about independence and connectedness. This is all part of the gender roles, um, the, the, the roles that, that genders play. What men are more independent. In fact, we saw this when we looked at the uh, those adjectives, the universal adjectives, the ones that were rated universally. Men were rated as more independent across all cultures. Um, women are much better at uh, expressing empathy. Um, look at this. Girls um, play as often in small groups and imitates relationships. Boys play as much more competitive and aggressive. That's just how they behave. I mean, you, a boy will find a way to make a toy gun. You know, if if you don't buy him a toy gun, he'll find a way to make one. He'll make a stick and he'll make one. Um, men, yeah, more dominant. We know this. Driven and aggressive. Uh, men are more likely to rate power and achievement as important. Um, there's no society in which a, uh, women usually dominate men. Well, I mean, definitely happens, but none. There's no society where that's the norm. Okay. Men are half of all jury members, but 90% of all jury leaders, okay? That's just what we do. Men still, generally speaking, still, it's men that usually ask out women on first date. It's not completely true. My wife asked me out for our first date. Just let you know. Um, oh, this one is really, really cool. There is a lot of words in there. I read it this morning. It hurt my eyes because it was small, 
but it was very cool. I want you to read this one. This is cool. Evolution and gender. Are we just doing what comes naturally? Or is gender some um, cultural thing that we've created? Uh, some people, um, some people. it's politically correct to, to do the whole, oh, the toy companies are trying to sell to our children what it means to be a boy and a girl. And There's something to that, of course. But you can't escape the fact that you are what you are, all right? And so read this slide. This is a really interesting one. Um, so now, what can we conclude about genes, culture, and gender? A given social situation often affects people differently. Yes. People choose their situations. Absolutely. People create their situations. Yes. So, biology and culture often tell us the right thing to do in a novel situation. We interpret the situation. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's basically saying nature and nurture interact with each other. Um... If you have nature, if you have biology, which says um, you're more outgoing, you know, there can be genetics to, that code for outgoingness. Therefore, it will cause you to pursue situations that are more outgoing situations, which will, in fact, make you more, even more outgoing than you were to begin with. So, nature and nurture interact with each other. The nature, we, you know, we choose our, our nurture in this sense. However, I want to go beyond nature and nurture. I promised you at the very beginning that I was going to um, go back and, and uh, give um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Jean Lamarck from slide way back at the beginning of the slide. I was going to give him a little bit of credit. So now, there's this thing now, this newer understanding of genetics, and it goes like this, that on top of your genome, you know, your genome, the, the layout of all the genetic codes you have, on top of that is something called the epigenome. The epigenome is a set of switches along the top of the DNA. And what happens is these switches are literally, they're, they're, they're a, so I mean, I'll keep it simple. It's a set of on and off switches. You have a particular set of DNA, but some of the DNA is turned on and some of the DNA is turned off. Okay, So all you got to do is switch these things up and down and up and down. Or say as an example, um, one of my favorite some researchers with a chicken and the chicken is developing and they did some fancy genetic bullshit I don't know what they did they go in there and, ding, 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 and they go along the epigenome and they turn this this one particular switch from off to on and lo and behold this chicken starts to develop and and as it's 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 growing it's shooting out a set of teeth chicken with teeth you can have a chicken sandwich that eats you. <laughs> you knew that joke was coming. So what the hell is that? Because there's all sorts of things potential coded in your genome that happens to be turned off. Okay? And so this idea is amazingly cool. Like, you could have a cloned kitten. All right? It's genetically exactly the same as its mother. That's what that's what its cloning is all about. Yet it can look radically different from its mother because of the epigenome, which switches are turned on and which switches are turned off. Okay. And so the epigenome is a really cool, it's got some potential. But here's the deal. The behaviors that we exhibit in our lifetime can influence our epigenome. Okay? Things that we do. In fact, here's here's some. So here's some words. Marcus Pembry and colleagues also observed uh, that the paternal but not maternal grandsons, okay, there's a lot of words. Here it was. He went to this one uh, pretty isolated village up in Sweden, and he looked at, uh, they kept really good records. You know, them Swedes do that kind of thing, right? They kept really good records of births and deaths and, you know, all of this stuff going back for a couple hundred years. So he goes back and he finds different weather, uh, different years. I mean, this village is so isolated that if it was a good crop this year, if it was good weather, then you're going to have a good a good winter. You're going to be happy. Uh, but if the, if the uh, seasons wasn't so good this year, you're going to starve. I mean, the village is so isolated that you, you make your own food, right? That's it. You don't get help from an outsider. So in some years, there was lots of food in the winter, and some years there was very little. And so then what he did was he found, he found some boys that had been um, like seven years old during these lean years, and he tracked their ancestors. 
And he found some boys where there was lots of food. I mean, food was readily available during, during those years. And he tracked their ancestors. And what he found was that um, when, when you go, when you've tracked it down, the, not only does, um, you know, eating lots of food affect those children, right? But it turns out that they're, they, the, those boys, when they had children, okay, if the boy suffered from famine when he was a kid, his own son lived longer, okay? His grandson lived longer. His, I believe, great-grandson lived longer, significantly longer than the great-grandson of the guy who had lots of food, okay? So it's a crazy thing because, you know, we can dig it. You know, uh, basically what this implies is, you know, if we do stupid things, uh, like when we're teenagers, you know what I mean, glug glug or something, um, we're thinking, okay, we're killing our brain cells or blah, 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 and, but at least it, it doesn't harm my baby, right, you know? No, it does. It messes with your epigenome, and once you, you've messed with your epigenome, you can pass that along to your children. This is a really cool um, uh, thing. It's a new thing, but what it says is the behaviors that we exhibit can, in fact, influence our uh, what we pass to our children. This is... Um, what this is is basically because biological evolution runs so slowly it takes so many thousands of years how can we how can the biological evolution possibly keep up with with rapid changes that are occurring in environment and the answer is it doesn't have to because the epigenome is there to tweak you can tweak yourself your tweak your genetics to fit your environment and so we find that within a couple of generations there can be some fairly radical um, changes in organisms uh, because of changes to the epigenome changes to the genome take 50 hundreds of generations changes to the epigenome take one or two generations so we find that animals can adapt to different environments very very rapidly because of the epigenome okay so whew. So that's a lot of words. I know I was overly excited there. I love this stuff. This is so fascinating to me. But uh, anyway, we're going to stop there. And uh, remember, we're going to come back in um, the next time. And we're going to talk in Chapter 6. And it's going to be the same basic idea. Um, you think that you are uh, making your own choices. I am my own man or woman. I make my own choices. I choose what I do. And it's like, no, you don't. Okay, and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the unseen forces which push and pull us. Okay, so I will see you the next time.